Greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, on the sixth Sunday of the season of Easter, and on this very special day where we kick off our One Heart and One Mind campaign. In General Washington's orders, on the 17th of December, 1777, yes, just a couple of days before we began to commemorate the encampment here at Valley Forge, after the disappointment of Germantown and Brandywine, and just before the beginning of the Valley Forge encampment, it is recorded that George Washington, quote, persuades himself that the officers and soldiers with one heart and one mind will resolve to surmount every difficulty with a fortitude and patience becoming their profession and the sacred cause in which they are engaged. And he himself will share in the hardship and partake of every inconvenience. Earlier in the same orders on December 17th, Washington gave the impetus for having such resolve in the face of difficulty. And this is what he said. We may upon the best grounds conclude that by a spirited continuance of the measures necessary for our defense, we shall finally obtain the end of our warfare, independence, liberty, and peace. These, Washington said, are blessings worth contending for at every hazard. Having the resolve to do what is necessary, using the words of Roosevelt, in the teeth of difficulty, that is not only what Valley Forge is about. It is what the book of Revelation is all about. And yes, it is truly what life itself is all about. Having the resolve to do what is necessary, most especially in the teeth of difficulty. I love the book of Revelation. I love it because it is actually meant and written for people that are in the midst of struggle and hardship. And because of this, the book of Revelation is relevant to every audience this side of the resurrection. The apocalypse to St. John was sent originally as a circular letter to real churches, the churches of the Asia Minor in the Roman Empire in the late first century. It was written to real people in real time and was meant to speak to their difficult situation in life. They found themselves in the midst of persecution for their faith in Christ. They were tempted to give up on their faith in order to save their lives in the here and now. Flourishing in their society meant bowing down to Rome and not taking that faith thing too seriously, you know. We've never heard anything like that, have we? The apocalypse or the revelation to John's its whole purpose is really to reveal or to unveil two realities. One, to reveal or unveil that which is true, that which is real, and that which is lasting. And second, to unveil or unmask that which is but a parody of the real, that which wears a mask, which pretends and believes that it is true, lasting, and real. And of course, in the first century context, that which needed that empire, which needed to be unmasked and unveiled for what it really and truly is to encourage these Christians was the Roman Empire. As the apocalypse or the revelation was then, as a circular letter, read out loud in the churches, it then inspired and encouraged God's people to keep the faith and persevere because the challenges of the present, the book of Revelation teaches, are nothing compared to the glory that is being shown to them. Current faithfulness is engendered by a glorious future hope. 
The hymn for all the saints names this beautifully. And when the fight is fierce, the warfare long, stills on the ear that distant triumph song. And hearts are brave again, and arms are strong. Alleluia, alleluia. Of course, Romans 8 says it well too, when Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed. You see, Valley Forge is a great and wonderful lens for understanding the revelation and truly the logic of Christian obedience. Driven by the hope of a world beyond all knowing of which words cannot describe, Christians in the first century pressed on toward the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. Because the future reality that was shown to them through the apocalypse reveals not Rome or Great Britain or any other nation of the world at the center of reality. No, at the center of reality in the world's fulfillment, God the Father and the Lamb, the Spirit of God are at the center of all reality. In the vision, all creation bows down not to Rome or any other empire of this world that is passing away, but they bow down to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb of God who has won the victory. In that vision, the people of God are revealed to be without threat. No night, no gate. Imagine a city that needs no gate and needs no walls, no pain, no crying. All that is evil, as Robert Jensen says, has been excised from the good kingdom of God in Jesus Christ. That's truly what judgment is, the excision of all that is evil from the good kingdom of Christ. Those who stand victorious in the book of Revelation stand victorious not because they won some competition or rat race, but because they were willing to trust God in the midst of difficulty. That's why their robes are washed white in the blood of the Lamb, because they participated in the victory of Christ, which means faithfulness to Christ no matter the cost. It is this vision that has driven Christians for hundreds and hundreds of years. Nothing this world that is passing away has to throw at us, can separate us from the victorious love of God in Jesus Christ. And therefore, we press on no matter what toward the high calling of God in Christ. Our hope engenders faith that the sufferings of our present time cannot be compared to the glory of the future that awaits us in Christ. But what in the world do Valley Forge and God's kingdom really have to do with one another, you ask? Can we really talk about these two things in a sermon or in the same conversation? Isn't one religious and the other secular, one sacred and the other profane? In today's passage from the book of Revelation, as the fulfillment is revealed, the city of God, which comes down from heaven to be married to earth, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation in 21 and 22 are the description of our ultimate destiny. And in these two chapters, we are shown what will no longer be in the city of God, and also what will be in the city of God. What won't be in the city we named death, chaos, pain, suffering, the need for walls and gates, and so forth. But we are also shown what will be included in the city of God. And one of these really struck me in preparation this week. The kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. The glory 
and the honor of the nations of the earth welcomed into the city of our God. This speaks of continuity between our lives now and our lives in fulfillment. Because truly, we can only be faithful in the localities in which we live and find ourselves. And that is truly what Revelation is all about. Eugene Boring said, God is not making all new things. God is making all things new. You see the difference? God is not making all new things. God is not giving up on that which is broken or lost. Instead, God is making all things new. That which exists, God is going to fill with his life-giving spirit. Nothing will be wasted. What this means is, as Thomas Aquinas said, that all good and all that is virtuous in the world is only good and virtuous because it participates in goodness itself, God. Good and virtue will never be wasted in God's world. That is why at the end of St. Paul's 15th chapter in his first letter to the Corinthians, as he's now talking about the, the what now after Easter and the resurrection, Paul says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that in the Lord your work is never in vain. Your work for the Lord will never be wasted. N.T. Wright in the book that we're reading right now, some of us surprised by hope, says you are not oiling the wheels of a machine that's about to roll over a cliff. You are not restoring a painting that's shortly going to be thrown onto the fire. No, he says, every act of love, gratitude, and kindness will find its way through the resurrecting power of God into the new creation that God will one day make. That includes what Revelation calls the glory and honor of the nations of the earth. And so that should make us ask the question, what is glorious and honorable about the United States of America? Sure, we have a lot of vice, a lot that we're not proud of, that's why there's the healing of the nations. That's why there's the tree of life with his leaves that are for the healing of the nations. Because we're broken and we need God's help. But what about America? What about Valley Forge specifically is honorable and glorious? And therefore worth preserving and passing on to generations yet unborn? I haven't heard anyone say it better than President Theodore Roosevelt. When he stood, I don't know if you all know this, when he stood on these very grounds here at Washington Memorial Chapel, June 19th, the celebration or the uh, commemoration of the evacuation of the Valley Forge encampment, and also the birthday of the chapel, June 19th, 1904, a year after the cornerstone was laid for this chapel, in that barn-like structure that was the temporary structure for the chapel, in his Washington Memorial Chapel address, Roosevelt honored two of the most important turning points in American history, both of which occurred here in the great state of Pennsylvania, Valley Forge and Gettysburg, Washington and Lincoln. And as heroic as the people of Gettysburg were, it is Valley Forge that Roosevelt believed was the prime example of what it means to be American and what future Americans needed to tap into. It was Valley Forge that revealed most what is so honorable and glorious about our nation. President Roosevelt said, I think as a people, we need more to learn the lesson of Valley Forge even than that of Gettysburg. I have not the slightest anxiety but that this people, if the need should come in the future, will be able to show the heroism, heroism, the supreme effort that was shown at Gettysburg. But the vital thing for this nation to do is steadily to cultivate the quality which Washington and those under him so preeminently showed during the winter at Valley Forge, the quality of steady adherence to the duty in the teeth of difficulty 
in the teeth of discouragement and even disaster. The quality that makes a man do what is straight and decent, not one day when a great crisis comes, but every day, day in and day out until success comes. Roosevelt then closed his address with these great words. I congratulate you, people of Washington Memorial Chapel, that it is in your good fortune to be engaged in erecting, maybe today he would say preserving, restoring a memorial to the man who is equal to the great days, to the man and the men who showed by their lives that they were indeed doers of the word and not hearers only. The spirit of perseverance for the greater good of liberty, peace, independence from evil and tyranny. Being of one heart and one mind united by this sacred cause, as Washington called it, our sacred duty, that is the spirit of Valley Forge, I think. Roosevelt believed that the way we uphold the honor and glory of our past is not to take it for granted. He said, quote, show by your lives that you profited by them. If we show that the lives of the great men and women of the past have been to us incitements to do well in the present, then we have paid to them the only homage which is really worthy of them. In Father Burke's sermon, Washington the Churchman preached on Washington's birthday in 1903, which was really the impetus for the building of the chapel at All Saints Church in Norristown. He said these words about the chapel and the people that come here. Would that there we might rear the wayside chapel fit memorial of the church's most honored son to be the nation's Bethel for all days to come, where the American patriot might kneel in quest of that courage and that strength to make all honorable his citizenship here below and prove his claim to that above. God is not making all new things. God is making all things new. God welcomes in the city of God our future, the glory and honor of our nation. What took place here in Valley Forge is worth preserving, it is worth imitating. And today we begin a journey of doing just that. Today we kick off our One Heart and One Mind Capital Campaign aiming to restore this great memorial and to preserve it for the sake of ongoing preservation, education, which will turn into growth, so that we might carry on the legacy of Washington and Valley Forge and Roosevelt and Burke and those who worked alongside him to make Christians who make society better. I think that's kind of what Burke was getting at. Christians who show themselves worthy of those who have gone before them. It will take nothing short of a miracle for us to do the work that is set before us. But with General Washington, I am persuaded that the people of Washington Memorial Chapel, you, with one heart and one mind, will resolve to surmount every difficulty with a fortitude and patience becoming of their profession and the sacred cause in which they are engaged. And so as Washington, on December 17th, before the encampment really ever began, called the chaplains and all of those who were at the service of the divine to offer a day of thanksgiving before it even happened, so I end giving God thanks for what God is about to do. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost.